coming up on this week's Outdoor Elements. I'm Evie Kirkwood from St. Joseph County Parks. And I'm Vince Gresham from the Cardinal Native Plant Nursery. And we're spending the day at the beautiful Fernwood Botanical Gardens and Nature Center in Niles, Michigan. Today we'll discover some of the diverse beetles we can see in our area. We're also going to go down by the river to do some outdoor yoga. I'm looking forward to that. That should, should be fun. And first, we're going to find out what made these holes in this freshwater clamshell and how it's tied to the history of the St. Joseph River. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana State Parks. down by the river and interestingly enough back from about 1850 to the mid 1900s clams were harvested for the pearl industry and we're going to learn a little bit more about that industry and the subsequent button industry with local historian Rick Gladonski and Rick you have been fascinated with the button industry on the St. Joseph River for many years, right? right. Yep. Yeah, so yes, you have yes. you have a great collection. So uh, from chatting with you earlier before we were even started here today, you told me once that clams were harvested for freshwater pearls right here in the St. Joe River, yep. is that right? Right. They were harvested, but they're hard to find. About okay. 1 in 10,000 clam shells have a pearl in it. Wow. So that's a lot of pearls, but then the meat that was in there is very edible, and then the, the clamshell itself became, as we know, secondary to the, to the button industry. So people were, were pulling clams out of the river, hoping to find pearls, pearl. but then they would have, and then they would eat the meat, but then they'd right. have all these shells, but right? To give you an idea, a pearl that was about a quarter inch back in uh, the turn of the century was worth about $80. Oh. And oh, if you found one that was about a half inch, that was about three hundred dollars. Oh my so gosh! That was big money so for these they, pearls. Yeah, and you have some uh, freshwater pearls right, right here in this right, case. Right, right, right. So and freshwater what? pearls are not like ocean pearls. Ocean pearls are almost almost always perfectly round. Right. These are what they call baroque. In other words, they're odd shaped. But it's, people it's are actually pretty, going yeah. back and liking. Yeah, those I kind of like the natural shape. So obviously, then people who were looking for our pearls would have a lot of leftover shells from the clams. Right. And there was an industry that grew up out of that, right? Right. This gentleman called John Boeppel came over from Germany. That's what his family did over there. He ended up on the Mississippi in Muscatine, Iowa, mm -hmm. and found mountains and mountains of shells. So he said, ah, free inventory. <laughs> so he got busy and he set up his factory and started uh, cutting the uh, blanks out and making buttons. Okay, so you have a couple of examples of freshwater clam shells where button blanks have been drilled out. So how were the buttons actually made? Okay, first they gotta be cut out of here so the shell has to be soaked for about two weeks and then drilled with water spray on it and they would take uh -huh. like a pipe that had teeth cut out and slowly rotate it in there and the blanks would fall out. Okay, and, and, I, be, and I can see, if I look really closely, I can actually see, see the, ridges. The grooves for the yeah, the, where that, the where that went in there. Yep. The, yeah, okay. So then there would be a bunch of blanks, but this looks kind of rough, right? So they must right. have done something okay. to it. When they were in the rough stage, then most of the factories shipped them off to either Chicago or uh, Milwaukee to a finishing plant where they would be ground flat, the edges knocked off, the holes cut in, and then the thread kerf, so the thread didn't get wore off. Oh, really? Okay. Then I... they would go to a finishing part of the factory where they'd be sewn on cards, usually three, three on a card, or five on a card, or eight on a card. And then they could be shipped off to a, right. a shop or a, right. a, a place where they could be sold. So you have some of the blanks right here, and these look like they've been polished, Those right? have been polished. These are rough blanks. They look yep. kind of nasty on the outside, yeah, but they the do. inside is still kind of clean. Kind, so. of, kind of shiny, right? Were there different grades or different qualities of right. shells? That would be part of the uh, assembly is going through and, and women sitting at tables with a little uh, fingers, whatever, spoons, whatever, scraping them all and matching color and quality. And there were these three grades, you know, good, medium, and best. So, okay. 
then they would send them off to wherever part of the factory that uh, did the rest of the machining. Okay, all right. Well, <coughs> if um, if people were actually then like discarding the shells and the shells were used for bl button blanks, right. but then there's still leftover yeah, this shell. This industry had a lot of scrap yeah. waste. I mean, they can't, yeah. So what did they do with then the leftover, well, okay. leftover shells? The leftover shells would be ground up like gravel and put in driveways and roadways, ground up even finer and it was a chicken food supplement because oh, it's yeah. calcium carbonate. I feed my chickens shell, so yeah, that's and pretty it makes, good. It makes the chicken eggs yeah. stronger. And then you even told me uh, a story about uh, mixing it into paint. It could be mixed right. into paint. At the House of David in Benton Harbor years ago, they ground it up, mixed powder in the paint, and when the light hits just right, it glows in these, these purple, greens, and blues. How many factories would have been like along the St. Joe River well, or in our area? From South Bend to Benton Harbor, there were eight. Really? That many? That many, yep. Okay. It, it was, you know, plum full of clams, and then they basically stripped the river. Back in the 1800s, how were the clams actually harvested? Well, or even the early the 1900s. The simplest thing was, you know, they long shore, just pick them up, throw them in a barrel. Mm. Then they had like a pitchfork, had a bunch of tines on it, and they would scrape them out in that. Okay. Then out in the river, they had uh, a, a metal pole that had three metal hooks, and this pole was 15, 20 feet long, and, and they would drag it along the bottom. The clams were like this. That hook would go through there, snap shut on them. Then they'd pull them up, get them in the boat. The clam realized it's not water, they'd drop them in the bottom of the boat. No kidding. Then they'd take them to shore, <laughs> put them into warm water. You do, if you boiled it, it would lock shut. Get in warm water, it opened up, uh, look for the pearl, get the meat out, throw the shell. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So it, there was a lot of handwork, a lot yes. of tedious time in actually mm -hmm. harvesting. But obviously the button industry only went so long. So what was what caused the decline? Of okay, the what happened in, in the industry was the Japanese perfected the plastic mm -hmm. in about 43. Then the other thing that really impacted it was the invention of the automatic clothes dryer. You can get a button as wet as you want it and air dry it, it's fine. You put it in that high temperature, and it defoliates and, and disintegrates. So the so people were putting their clothes in, coming out, no buttons oh, on. Oh, so the shell buttons would just break down. Break down. Yeah. And of course, as you mentioned earlier, the clam population in our freshwater stream, St. Joseph River, right. has has dramatically declined. Right. It's it's coming back slowly. G great, great. And then people don't realize clams were water purifiers. They were, yeah. And, they, yeah. The, they filtered and that's up when the river, you could drink drink right out of the river. It was so clean back in the back, century. Back in the day, yeah. Well, Rick, this is really interesting uh, to see all the many different facets of the button making process. Even fishing lures were made well, out of Well, there were so many things because uh, Mother Pearl was basically the plastic before plastics. Yep. They, they made, I've got binoculars with that on, different in instruments. Like there's a spoon right here making yeah, clamshells. Yeah, that's shells. beautiful. I love it. All yeah. kinds of things that had to be durable, they would put uh, the mother of pearl on it. That's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us a little bit about local history that some folks may not even be aware of. Thanks right. so much. You're welcome. I was walking along the trail here, and I found a cool mushroom on the ground. It's pretty dried up. But this is a puffball. There are a lot of different types of puffball mushrooms. And I know puffballs for two things. If you find a big puffball when it's fresh, it's edible. If you find it later like this when it's dried out, one of the things that makes it interesting that gives it its name is this puff. It, if you step on a puffball mushroom, its spores release and it kind of looks like smoke. So that's why they call it a puffball. Several years ago, I had the privilege of getting a behind the scenes tour at the Chicago Field Museum. And one of the things I remember most was the insect collection and how many beetles they had in their insect collection. There were thousands of beetles. And here's a little beetle right here. And we're here at Fernwood Botanical Garden and we're talking to Corey Hopwood, who's gonna tell us a little bit about beetles. Now, Corey, if I'm hiking out on a trail somewhere in my garden and I see an insect, how do I know if it's a beetle? What's, what are the, some of the characteristics that tell me it's a beetle? 
Well, beetles are pretty recognizable for the most part. They all have just kind of a general beetle shape. They're usually fairly round, though there are some longer and skinnier varieties. The best thing to look for is what's called the elaters. All beetles have two sets of wings, but the front wing in most species is very hard and it covers most, if not all, of their back. So it almost looks a little bit like a shell on the, yes, on the back. Yes, yeah. but it does have a line here called the suture where it separates so that they can take out their softer flight wings. So and this one happens to have a little thorn, uh, horn looking thing on the front there too. But they are insects, so they have six legs and they have three body mm -hmm. parts. So you have a nice collection here. You have a whole bunch of different beetles that are pinned. What are some of the more interesting ones that we might see around in our area? In our area, we have, well this rhinoceros beetle is actually native to our area, so you could potentially find it right here. But we have a lot of different species right in our area. Some are very common, like most people are familiar with June bugs. Well, that's a colorful green. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is called a green June bug, so there are the more common yeah. black ones, but these are very common as well. They're attracted to lights at night, as yeah. most people know. I've seen these around like my, my screen porch mm -hmm. at night, yeah. Yep. And if you wanted to attract more of them uh, for catching and collecting or other purposes, the easiest thing to do is to just put out a white sheet, shine a bright light at the base of the sheet, shining well, up against it. They'll get it, drawn right to and that. And you'll get all kinds of bugs and a lot of June Excellent. beetles in the middle and I, of summer. I see from the side, if we turn it, it's really an iridescent color yeah. on the side. I, don't, I know it's fragile, but it's sort see of, that iridescent color, yeah. That's described as a metallic green yeah. color, so it's very shiny and bright. And then on the back, it's sort of a softer matte green yeah. as well. So there are some beetles that are kind of plain, but some that have this really bright coloration, this really metallic colors. You have some really cool colored ones in here. Um, this one right here I noticed, this, I've seen this one on trails before. What can you tell us about this one there? This one is a tiger beetle. And tiger beetles are a very common beetle actually. There's a lot of different kinds. They're incredibly fast runners and they use that speed to catch their prey. Uh, some varieties specialize on caterpillars or earthworms. Uh, a lot of them will just eat whatever kind of bug they can catch. So they're very cool to find. You find them out in sandy patches with sun shining on them or on the edges of woods. So this it has some spots on it and um, it's got, it looks like it has three on one side and three on the other side there. Mm -hmm. And so I, is this one of those six spotted be beetles they talk about? Yep, very good. This yeah. is a six spotted tiger beetle. And it's got some big jaws there. So, so this one's a predator. Are all beetles predators or they have different diets? Beetles are extremely diverse and they have all different manner of diets. A lot of them specialize on uh, specific plants or members of one specific family of plants. So if you think of almost any plant in the world, there is a beetle that loves to eat that, okay. which makes them very common and important agricultural pests as well. Yeah, maybe some people are familiar with certain ones on their garden mm -hmm. that they might see. Well, I think what we'd like to do is step outside and see if we can see some out outside. So we'll go on a little search All right. for some. So we're out here. You have a collection of beetles here. Now, how did you find these beetles? How would someone go out and, and search for and collect beetles? Well, the first step is something anyone can do right away, and that's just go outside and look. It's amazing once you start really paying attention, you can find things all over the place. And you can look on flowers and grass, on the ground, under rocks and logs. Because they live in so bark. many different places, they right? They live everywhere. Yeah. They fill every niche on land and in any aquatic environment. Let's uh, take a look at some of the ones that you got here. I'm going to pick whichever one you think is interesting and show it to us. So, well, this is one of my favorites right here. This is a Harpalis beetle. They were pretty fast. And this well, it is a looks type like of ground it is beetle. trying to run pretty fast. Yes. If we set it down, it probably would get away from us pretty quickly. It would get away it? from us right away, yeah. And they, um, they like to eat a lot of plant material. Other varieties of ground beetles like to eat meat, and you can actually catch them in a pit trap. Just dig a hole, put a can down in it, and bait and it with some meat. they'll run right into it. Yep, make sure it's level with the ground, and they'll go in, leave it out overnight. What else do we have here? We have, let's see. This is one of my favorite guys right here, and you'll notice this doesn't actually look like a beetle. It doesn't. It's a larva. Okay. This is actually a click beetle larva, sometimes called a wire worm. Wire worms eat a wide variety of things. Some of them are important agricultural pests. So a lot of people, if they think about insect larvae, they think of caterpillars and butterflies mm -hmm. and moths, but actually beetles have that same four-part life cycle, right? Yep, beetles undergo complete metamorphosis, so they start life as a larva. Think, when you think of a grub you find when you're gardening, that's actually a June beetle larva. And you have a grub over here somewhere, don't you? I do. Now I've seen these, I've been digging around my garden and accidentally dig one up, and sometimes they get pretty big. 
And quite frankly, mm -hmm. even though I like bugs, they're kind of gross looking, but what can yeah. you tell us about this one? Well, they'll live underground, just eating from plant roots and things, and so they are kind of the bane of a lot of gardeners. The people aren't usually too happy to find them because they do damage plants sometimes, but they're also a sign of a healthy lawn. They Got only it. survive in soil that has diverse ecology in it and healthy roots for them to chew on. Well, it looks like he's kind of waking up. It was curled up like he was scared when we first grabbed him. Now he's kind of waking up, and I noticed it has some pinchers there. Yeah. Like he's got a mouth that might pinch my hand, but... He won't hurt yeah. you. He can't... They're not good for biting meat. Cool. And he's uh, actually kind of panicking right now. Yeah. He's saying, looks where's little, the dirt? Where's the dirt? I need scared. to get underground. Oh, oh. And he just pooped on me. <laughs> well, that's, that's what happens, That happens. Guess, that's part of nature. Wildlife. So we'll put him and his poop back in the jar. Um, now, we've got this pond behind us. When we first walked up, I noticed there were some... Uh, beetles that were on the surface, but mm -hmm. some beetles, like you mentioned, they do live in an aquatic environment. So do we have an aquatic beetle here to take a look at? We do have an aquatic beetle. This was caught just this morning by some kids on a field trip, actually. So they saved him for me here. This is probably a predaceous diving beetle, though it's hard to tell without taking out uh, my microscope and getting a good look at it. It may be a whirligig bug, just like those, because the whirligig bugs will dive down and other beetles will come to the surface. So you said predaceous, like some of the beetles that live in the water are predators. One of, mm -hmm. They have different things. They might eat mosquitoes in the water, is that correct? Yeah, they eat just about anything they can find. The rule of the pond is if you're big enough to eat it, you eat it, and if it's big enough to eat you, you run away. So you have more here. We don't have a chance to get to all of them because there are so many beetles, but that's kind of the thing with beetles. There's mm -hmm. so many. If you want to learn a little bit more about beetles, what can you do to learn a little bit more about them? Well, there's a lot of resources. One of my favorite ones right here is Beetles of Eastern North America. That looks and like this, a good one. Yeah, it contains actually only about 10% of all the beetles wow. that you might find in our area. It has over 1,400 different species so in it. So it's packed with beetle mm -hmm. photos, and that's 10%. Yes, huh. but it has all the most common ones. It's very rare to find something that is not in here. So thanks. We learned a lot about beetles. If you'd like to learn more about beetles, visit our website. In fall, people are often curious about this particular plant that gets pretty tall with these bright red stems and these beautiful purple berries. It's called pokeweed or sometimes pokeberry. The dark purple berries are toxic to humans, but many, many birds and animals can actually eat these. In years gone by, people would actually squeeze the berries to get out the bright pink juice and either make ink or dye. So next time you're walking in the woods in fall, look for the purple berries of pokeberry. We're here at Fernwood Botanical Garden, and it's already a really beautiful, relaxing setting, but we're going to take the relaxation a little bit further because we're here with Deirdre Guthrie, who's going to tell us a little bit about outdoor yoga. So, welcome. Uh, I've done a little bit of yoga before, but I don't know a lot about the background of it. Where did yoga originate? So yoga is a Hindu practice from India, and it's a physical practice designed to get you in your body and actually prepare the body for meditation originally. Okay. So yeah, a lot of the poses are inspired by animals, you know, the shapes of animals, yeah. um, and the way animals move in nature. And yeah, it really helps us in the modern world full of multitasking, get centered and grounded. And I, I always feel better when I, I've done it a couple of times, I'm a beginner, but you know, what is it about doing yoga outdoors that makes it a little bit better? Well, I, I love practicing here. Um, we've been doing this now, I think for over almost 12 years. And the thing, because you want to get into the state of meditation, there's something about being in nature in this container of you know, wind and trees and earth. Got a lot of wind right now yes, today. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, the river going yeah. by. Um, that really immediately brings us into this state of being in your body, feeling the sensations of your five senses, mm -hmm. you know, not just sight, but hearing, sensing. And that keeps us in this kind of experiential self versus all the stories that are running through our brains oh, yeah. and minds. Right there with your surroundings. Yeah. yeah, all the distractions yeah. in our head. What are some of the like studies or the research that's out there that, that really show that being outside does reduce stress level and yeah. focuses your attention. There are several, right? Oh yeah, um, the Healthy Minds Institute out of Madison is, is really pioneering, I think since the 70s, this kind of neuroscience around the benefits of, of meditation and yoga. Um, so it has all kinds of benefits, focusing your attention, um, rebooting your creativity. I mean, if I, I'm a researcher and writer, when I hit writer's block, I go for a walk in nature and then something shifts and I'm able to sort of 
you know, feel an opening. Um, and yeah, they believe that it arrests or it gives your prefrontal cortex a break and allows just you wow. to be refreshed so wow. that you can, you know, again, be just more focused and centered and have more creative, you know, focused capacity. It, and there's yeah. even a practice in Japan where mm -hmm. people actually, I think they call it forest bathing, yeah, right? Where they're just Oko, out yeah. sitting in the woods, essentially. Yeah. Yes, yes, we're going to, um, we, we have seasonal contempl contemplative retreats here at Fernwood and um, we usually accompany the seasons with um, this forest bathing practice of walking meditatively through the woods. Well, Vince has done yoga, okay, but I have not, so this will be totally <laughs> yeah. new for okay. me. Um, and I'm hoping then you could show us maybe some breathing techniques or some moves. Sure. Or oh, yeah. we've got this beautiful location. Yeah. So yeah, let's do it. So let's do something. Okay. Um, so we'll start with tree pose since we're in this beautiful That's forest. Yeah. Seems fitting. Okay. So we'll just shift our weight into our right leg, and then turn your left knee out. It's opening to the hip. And so really feel like you're pulling energy up from that standing leg. And if you want, you can leave the toe on the earth or you can bring it up to your inner thigh and then bring your palms together. And then focus on some point out there in the distance. That's your drishti, your focal point that helps the brain grab something for your balance. Very nice. And then this is tree pose. If you feel like you have roots growing through your your feet, you can rise through the branches and the arms and maybe have oh, some fluttering okay. leaves oh, in there the you go. fingertips. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's nice. Yeah, and so we can hold this pose, you know, for, for a while. And it really helps people, again, get more focused. Um, there's a couple of tools we use to stay in the moment, and one is this drishti or focal point, and the other, you can go to the other side here if you want, so you're even. Um, the other is the breath as oh, you right. said so you can do that you know the breath is part of every pose you're sort of wrapping the postures around the breath the other way to feel the breath um, is to move with the breath it's called vinyasa um, so we can move into a different pose here warrior two and then you take the drishti on your palm and we're just going to keep looking at our palm as we bring the hands together straighten the knee and then exhale down and across and so what we're doing now is very simply linking the breath to movement. So not rushing through it. Inhaling up. It's almost this feeling of moving through water. You kind of create a little resistance there. And then that long exhale as you come back into warrior two. So one more time like that. Yeah, and you can maybe hear that ocean sounding breath at the same time, really nice. And then hold warrior two and then let's take a dancer pose so leaning back looking into the trees the moving leaves feeling the wind and then exhaling pulling your forearm down sailing that right arm across the ear right into side angle pose yeah great and then you can make a big circle with that arm and pull yourself back up to warrior two yeah Feeling pretty relaxed already. Now, know, I've done this. Too. I've done yoga a few times. <laughs> yeah. But I still consider myself a beginner. If people want to take it a little step further, if I decide to stick with it, what other kinds of yoga can a, can someone do? Yeah, there's so many forms of yoga, and they're kind of connected to different teacher lineages. So hatha yoga is sort of the umbrella term, and within that, depends kind of what lineage we're talking about. You were mentioning hot yoga. Yep. Some people really love the heat, mm -hmm. um, and it brings them. You know, it relaxes the muscles. Um, there's Kriya Yoga, which has a lot of, that's the, the lineage that, that I studied in, um, which it was a seminary actually. And there's a lot of cleansing techniques involved in, in that piece, um, a lot of pranayama, the breathing, the breath work. Um, yeah, I mean, there's really so many. I think it, it just depends on finding a teacher that you feel comfortable with mm -hmm. and making sure that you have, uh, you kind of learn that yoga voc vocabulary. And then it's really important, um, I believe, to use props so that you can be moved into the postures at your own pace. So you're not trying to fit yourself into some, oh. you know, image. So a beginner of that's it. maybe not quite as good at all the poses have something to help them out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there, there's blocks and straps, and or even ways to just adjust the poses or warm your kind of warm ups before you go mm -hmm. into a, 
a version of a pose that can make it accessible to everybody. And yeah. one quick last question, because I talked to folks who have never done yoga before yeah. and they're a little apprehensive. Yeah. So what should they expect if they go to an outdoor yoga class? Should they bring a mat? Yeah. What, what, how do they dress? Yeah, yeah. So um, here at Fernwood, you just want to wear loose, comfortable, um, sort of tight-fitting clothing, but something that breathes and moves with you. Um, this class is open to all levels, so I really encourage people to, you know, move at their own pace. Um, the people who are more practiced will bring more weight into a pose or, or maybe do a few more vinyasas, while the others who are new will still be learning and I'll be helping them adjust them to find that alignment. So it's possible to do that if you feel comfortable with the teacher. Um, so I, I certainly hope people feel comfortable coming here to Fernwood for that experience. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was I great. I already feel relaxed. Right. I, I feel loosened up, ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready for it. Yeah, yeah yep. actually, let's go take a nap. <laughs> great, great being out here at, in the beautiful woods and trying some of those outdoor yoga poses. We appreciate it. You're it was welcome. fun. Okay. Thanks. So the outdoor yoga was pretty relaxing. I'm feeling great. That was really, really lovely. And I was fascinated to learn about the freshwater pearl industry. Yeah, there's some really neat history there. That was yeah. great. And the beetles, the water beetles, the beetle larva, that was, that's neat stuff. It's always fun to explore here at Fernwood Botanical Gardens and Nature Center. Remember, you can find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. We'll see you next time. For more information on this and other episodes, go to the Outdoor Elements website at wnit.org backslash outdoor elements. Catch up on recent episodes and find additional resources like hands-on activities and informational PDFs. It's one more way to help you find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources and the Indiana State Parks. Outdoor Elements is made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.